Wind Energy students, Dr. John Trage here, and we're starting now the rather long lecture that's about measurement theory, or at least that's what this textbook is calling this, uh, this section of the chapter. Some of these ideas are definitely classically what a physicist or a biologist or a chemist would call measurement theory. Some of these things are a little bit more specialized. I'm not exactly sure these are exactly measurement theory ideas, but they certainly are good things to be knowing about how we're going to be working with the measurements that we're getting. Um, your, your textbook just sort of throws this sort of glib definition about measurement theory out, and it's fine with me. It just says it's how to look at and analyze data in general, and measurements in particular. In other words, how to get a sense of what they're meaning, what does the measurement actually tell you about what's really going on. A measurement is always just an estimate of what's really going on. Um, how do we, what kind of, what can we glean from these measurements and so on. And the book suggests that the first thing you should do any time that you get some new data set, like observations from a wind station that you have at your prospective site for a wind power plant, is to get an idea of what that data looks like. Um, this is usually done through some kind of visualization. And your textbook, for example, takes that data set that's available from the author's website. There's like a QR code you can use to get that, or I can send you the link if you have trouble getting that QR code to work. And they work with those data sets in the textbook, and I downloaded them and work with them too. Now, in the textbook, for whatever reason, in this chapter, he's only processing the first 90 days of the data set that he makes available. But I'd say, go big or go home, okay? I went ahead and loaded the whole thing into an Excel spreadsheet, which was not an entirely trivial thing to do. There was actually some technical complications of getting that to work and so on. But we could um, load that. Uh, I've got 365 days of data here, each one of which is has wind observations from some station every 10 minutes. It worked out to like 54,000 observations over that one year period. And it just comes from that file that you can download from his website and um, import into Excel. It takes a fairly fancy set of Excel skills to get it uh, into a format like what I did right here, where you can actually see, you know, I had to break out the columns so that we had year, month, day, hour, minute, and the actual uh, speed and the wind direction of them and so on. We'll get to all that work in just a little bit, but even from just a simple plot of like wind speed on the uh, y-axis versus day of year on the uh, x-axis, you can see a lot about the data. I mean, this just simple visualization already tells you a fair amount about what is going on in your data set. For example, I can get a pretty good sense right off the bat as to what the range of my data is. I can see that I have plenty of observations where the wind speed is right around zero meters per second. And I have some observations that are as high as about 23 meters per second. That was a pretty windy day at that station. 23 meters per second is right around 45 miles an hour. So uh, that was a pretty windy 10 minute period there. Um, so right off the bat, just from this simple visualization, I can see that there are uh, what the range of the wind speeds was. And I can see that there are periods where the winds are stronger and there are periods when the winds are weaker. And in fact, with a little closer examination, I can see that these periods of enhanced winds are, you know, occurring every few days, maybe every five days or so. On average, we have a windier period. These are synoptic scale weather events. Clearly, this is like cyclones and anticyclones passing the location where this, uh, this, this uh, anemometer was being, was working. Um, one other thing that we can see just by looking at the data is that it's all there. Now, often it's the case that instruments do miss some reports. Maybe uh, the instrument needs servicing or there was a power outage or whatever. And typically, when the file, uh, the way the files indicate that is by putting a so-called missing value into that spot. There is no true observation of the wind at a particular time, and it'll put some obviously wrong value there like typically something like negative 999. Well, clearly the wind cannot be nearly a hundred, I have a wind speed of nearly a hundred meters per, I'm sorry, nearly a thousand meters per second, not to mention in the negative direction. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. There's no such thing as a negative wind speed. So uh, like in this case here, I faked it. I put two little periods in there where the wind speeds were missing. And so when I tried to just plot them in Excel, you can see it messed the whole plot up because now it changed the y-axis so that it spans from uh, negative 1,200 to positive 200 meters per second of wind speed, which means all the real observations are clustered right there around the zero axis. 
it's clear that something is wrong in this case because I clearly have some missing data. Missing data is part of life and you have to know how to deal with it when you're doing things like computing the average and so on. You don't include these missing value flags of like negative 99 when you're adding up all the values and then dividing by how many values there are to compute the average. You'd be adding in these nonsensical values of, in this case, negative 999. And so we would have to be very careful when we're computing the average or the standard deviation or something like that, that we are excluding the missing values. Survivors of like the Energy 301 modeling electrical load and yield class know that there was like lots of problems with missing observations and so on. When we were working with data sets that were helping us uh, come up with estimates of like, you know, relationships between temperature and electrical load due to air conditioning and things like that. Um, these kind of periods of these missing data can happen for lots of different reasons. Typically, it's like the equipment was malfunctioning and it shut itself down until a technician was able to come and service it. That's a very common thing. Uh, you know, some fuse blew or something like that, and the equipment is just in standby waiting for someone to come out and service it. Now, if, for example, there's just some technical problem with the equipment and it just randomly went out, um, uh, well, actually, that's not the end of the world with regard to, like, computing averages and other statistics to describe your wind data, because those are, uh, those outages of the data are actually fairly random. Uh, they just happened because of something that was outside. It wasn't caused by the speed of the wind or something like that. On the other hand, you could have non-random reasons why you might have missing data, too. For example, in this case, the, w the wind data from uh, the Landberg website doesn't look too bad at all. Um, but there is sort of a pattern to the missing data. I actually faked it here and put missing data flags in any time the wind speed was reported to be greater than 15 meters per second. I'm kind of trying to simulate what the data would look like if, for example, maybe the anemometer tends to break or uh, shut itself down to protect itself or something every time the, the wind got greater than some wind speed. Oh, okay, in fact, you can kind of just by seeing that box there, kind of start getting a sense that it looks like the data is a little clipped here. We certainly have a lot of missing data. Uh, anytime the wind speed was greater than, in this case, 15 meters per second, well, that's a very non-random way to be missing data. I mean, we're not just missing any old, you know, just by random chance some data didn't happen, didn't get taken. We're actually missing the biggest values. Well, that's going to throw the average way off, right? If we're not adding in the full range of observations that can come from your instrument, we're not going to be co correctly computing things like the average or the standard deviation, you know, of your data set. And that would be hard to catch. I mean, you have to, you know, look through your data, make graphs, start figuring out what's going on with all this missing data. Now, missing data can be a big problem then or a small problem. It's not the end of the world if, if data that is missing the data that are missing, the word data is plural, if the data that are missing are kind of random, okay? On the other hand, if they are non-random, like you're missing all the observations when the wind speed is greater than this, or you're missing all the observations that happen at a particular time of day, you never get the observation, say, at night, okay? Well, that would be a very non-random way to be uh, missing data, and that would be a very serious problem. You wouldn't be able to compute a very meaningful average wind if you don't ever know the winds at, say, night, or under certain weather patterns or something like that. Non-random is a problem when you're talking about missing data. It can be really difficult to compare data from different sources if they have a lot of missing data, or if one data set, like from this anemometer, has a lot more missing data than that anemometer does. It can be very difficult to figure out how to calibrate them, how to compare the results from one anemometer to another if they have very different uh, amounts of data that are missing. And so it's useful to have a statistic that helps ex describe how much of the data is there versus how much is missing. And the statistic that your book suggests is the so-called recovery rate. Recovery rate is a measure of how often there actually are good observations in your, in your data archive that should have been there. And it's given by the symbol R, where it's just the ratio of the number of valid data points there are in the data set divided by the number that were possible. So, for example, if you were measuring something once every hour, in a 24-hour period, it would be 24 possible observations. If you collected 18 valid observations and the other six are missing, then your recovery rate R would be 18 divided by 24, or 0.75. 
The question is, I mean, this is easy to figure out. Excel can do it, etc. Um, what, what's a good recovery rate? Now, your book throws out this number. It says, well, you're definitely going to want your recovery rate to be at least 90%. You want at least 90% of the time your your machine is your sensors, your instruments are actually reporting a valid wind speed or temperature or pressure, or whatever kind of instrument we're talking about. And I would say that that's a little bit of a screwy thing. I mean, some the recovery rate is important to know, but you know, you really also got to know how random these missing data are. I mean, like this one, just to go back to the one that I had before, where I was uh, deliberately erasing all the values greater than 15 meters per second, simulating this idea that like the anemometer would go offline if it was too windy. Um, that's a serious problem. That would definitely be a major red flag that computing things like averages and standard deviations for this data set would be a problem, despite the fact that if you compute the value of R in this particular case, the ratio of the number of observations that got to the total number came out to actually 0.985. I mean, this would look like a very good recovery rate, but because the missing observations are not random, it's actually kind of a problem. So it's more a matter of you got to know the nature of what observations are missing. I do a lot of my research with uh, data that comes from sensors that are deployed in sub-Saharan West Africa. And I can tell you a lot of times we don't have recovery rates of 90%. There's, you know, if, if, a, if a particular piece of weather instrument uh, breaks in Burkina Faso, it can, it's not like they can just run down to the hardware store and, and get a replacement for that part, typically it has to be ordered from someplace, which means it has to clear customs, it has to get sent through the mail in West Africa, which could be a challenge. It can be days to weeks before that instrument is back up online over something relatively small, a small part that went bad. So it's often the case that we will have these giant gaps, which would result in very poor recovery rates. You know, maybe over this year the machine broke a couple times and we ended up with only getting a recovery rate of 50%. That's that's life. Say Afrique, as we say in African meteorology. That means that's Africa. Okay, um, it, it's okay. We'll make it work. But so I don't know that I think that ninety percent cut threshold is necessarily so important as understanding the nature of the missing observations. Now let's go back though and just take a look at the actual full data archive that comes from the Landberg website, which I have plotted up here. And if we were just exploring this data, just you know, we're not yet ready to make any decisions about the wind distribution and things like that. If we're still just exploring it and so on, there's a number of basic statistics we could be computing based on this data. Like we could compute the mean wind speed or we could compute the standard deviation, which is the scatter of the observations around that wind mid speed and so on. And I did that just easily in Excel. Um, you'll notice that these values are a tiny bit different than with values that are in your textbook. Keep in mind, in the textbook, he was only working with the first 90 days of this data, whereas I'm working with the full 365. So my numbers are a little bit off compared to his, although surprisingly close. Um, anyway, so those kind of statistics are actually pretty straightforward to compute, and I don't think I need to teach you what an what I'm, you know, computing a mean and so on is all about. Now, all that we've seen so far has been about wind speed. What about wind direction that would be coming to us from like a wind vane? How do we work with wind vanes and wind directions? And to understand this, we need to understand how we're going to quantify the wind direction. How are we going to associate the direction the wind is coming from with a number? And the answer is we're going to be using the azimuth. Uh, we'll see that word in just a second here, which is a, a number that describes the, the direction on the horizon where like it is works the way this wheel is uh, drawn on here, this, this uh, compass or whatever they have on, on the screen here, where when the wind is from the north, we say that its azimuth angle is zero degrees. And then if it's, the wind is from the east, we say that the, azimuth, that the wind is from 90 degrees. 90 degrees is east in this coordinate system. If the wind is from the south, we would say that the wind is from 180 degrees. And if the wind is from the west, we would say it's from 270 degrees. And in fact, we can use any um, integer, well, we could use any real number uh, for the angle that the wind is coming from. In practice, we typically only measure wind uh, the resolution of the wind observations is typically either 5 degrees or 10 degrees. So, I mean, we aren't going to generally find like a wind direction of 14 degrees or something, which would be a little bit east of north. I want to draw your attention to some terminology, especially since some of the students in the class are from other parts of the world, just to make sure we're clear. Um, we use terminology to describe the angles between like north and east as like 
uh, halfway between north and east is northeast. A little bit north of northeast is called north northeast, like at about 30 degree angle. Uh, east northeast is a little bit to the east of northeast, and it would be like at an angle of like 60 degrees. And I just spell that out for each of the four quadrants that the winds can come from. You know, be halfway between east and south is southeast. A little east of southeast is east southeast with an angle of like 120 degrees. A little south of southeast is 150 degrees. We call that south southeast. Again, turning then to the southwest quadrant, from the southwest, like halfway between south and west, would be southwest, and that's 225 degrees. A little bit to the south of that would be uh, an angle like uh, 210 degrees. We call that south-southwest. Winds a little bit to the west of southwest are west-southwest. And you can see the pattern continues for the northwest quadrant as well with terms like west-northwest, west-northwest, and north-northwest. Okay, I know it's tricky. I can only imagine how hard it is to learn something like that if, if English isn't your first language or whatever, but you do need to know all those numbers and like how those terms work, okay? It'd be very difficult to be doing wind power type applications and not know what we meant by north-northwest or something like that. Okay, now all that gave us inf gave a way to describe the direction of the wind. When weather reports come in from airports or um, field stations or whatever, they will report that the wind is 8.2 meters per second from 35 degrees. Okay, that's actually what's coded up in the observation. And we can make a graph that tells us something about how often the wind is coming from any particular observation direction. We can get that from an archive like what we are seeing in that Lamberg data set over the 54,000 observations using a graph called a windrose. And this diagram that I have over here on the... Um, the right hand side of the screen is a wind rose and it's a visualization of the distribution of the winds at a, at a given location. But you're not yet ready to know what that diagram is. We kind of have to pick this apart a little bit. So what I did is I took all this data from that Landberg website and loaded it up into Excel. So uh, you might remember there's sort of a timestamp on each line. There's like a timestamp comma, the wind speed in meters per second, comma, and that final number is the current wind direction being reported by the instrument there. And I went through, and it's, again, it's Excel. Uh, it's a little bit tricky, but not the end of the world, to do something like make a histogram of that data, where in little five-degree increments, like from zero to five meters per second, five meters to ten meters per second, and so on, I made a bar graph that shows how often each of those occurred. And you could make a histogram of, in this case, all the wind directions. And you can see that all, all the wind directions are represented. There aren't any wind, any directions that the wind didn't blow from during the course of that year in the Landberg data set. Okay. Uh, but I can also see that, like, for example, there is a direction from which the wind is coming more often than others. Because um, those bars are tallest. And it appears to be in the range of, like, 240 to maybe 290 degrees um, you know, what is that? That's like southwest towards west. Uh, you know, the winds are from a particular area. Um, and, and this would be okay. We could make this diagram. Well, but that's actually what this windrose is. And in fact, the windrose gives us the same information, but in a form that's actually a little bit more intuitive once you understand how the plot works. Picture this, this, this histogram that I made before, but instead of it being little columns, the way you've been making histograms since you were like a first grader. Um, let's just connect the top of all those histograms here with a line, okay? So we just sort of have represented it with a line rather than a uh, series of those bars. Okay, I, th that hasn't changed anything fundamentally. And then instead of having those values plotted on an x-axis, let's actually just wrap them around on the, the, the wind, on the, uh, the compass. So like these you know, the one that's pointing towards zero degrees, that is from zero degrees, and that's from uh, from five degrees and so on. And what you could see, I mean, I could overlay the compass directions there, and you can see how, like, that part that's farthest away from the origin, it becomes much more clear that that's, like, the tallest bars on our diagram that we were working with when we saw the histogram. So we can see very clearly that the vast majority of the wind observations had wind speeds, I mean, wind directions, rather, between about, oh, I don't know, 250 degrees and maybe 290 degrees. And I can see the other directions are also represented. I can see there's a secondary peak 
with a lot of wind op, uh, observations around 210 degrees, which is from the south southwest. I can see that there's another area kind of out towards the uh, southeast. So that's winds again. We're describing how often the wind is from that direction. Let's be clear about that. So that big bulge that's pointing towards 260 degrees means that the wind is often from 260 degrees, which is like west north. I'm sorry, west southwest. Okay. The farther poked out this is, the more often the wind was observed coming from that direction. Now, just to deliberately quote your textbook about wind roses there, it says that the great advantage of a wind rose is that it gives a very intuitive impression of the wind direction distribution. We can look at that diagram and very quickly see which way the wind is mostly coming from. The main disadvantage is that it does not tell us anything about the wind's speed. There's nothing on that wind rose that's telling us anything about whether those winds are strong or, or whether the winds are weak. Now, there's other ways that we could be exploring the wind data, and one would be to use just a simple scatter plot. I mean, I could take the full 54,000 lines of data that come from that Landberg website, and I could just plot them as a scatter plot, where the wind speed direction is, I'm sorry, the wind speed number is my x coordinate in this case, and the wind direction number is my y coordinate. I could just use something as simple as Excel to make this plot. And your author had a very similar plot in the textbook, albeit only for uh, 90 days. And just by glancing through this plot, a number of interesting little patterns become apparent that wasn't obvious when you had like that line graph or when we had the histogram. For example, Okay, the farther to the right you are on this diagram, the stronger the winds are. And I see that those strongest winds are all coming from one particular set of directions. Uh, looks like it's a range from about 250 to about 300. That's like west to northwest. The strongest winds come from one particular set of directions at this location. Neither of the other charts that we saw so far could tell us something like that. In the same sort of way, I can see that the winds are particularly weak when they're from about 160 to 180 degrees. In other words, when the winds are from the south at this location. Maybe at this location, to the south of this anemometer, there was some obstruction of the flow, like maybe a hedgerow or a, um, a windbreak of trees or something like that. And so when the wind was from the south, the winds were weaker. You can see a number of those kinds of insights you can get into the wind data just by having plotted something as simple and not particularly complex as like a scatter plot. Now, I do want to draw your attention to like kind of a more philosophical, theoretical type point. I mean, every spot on this diagram represents an, an observation that was in that data set. So what actually is that value that I have circled right there? I mean, like, what does it actually tell us about the natural world? What is that thing? Well, that is just a pair, an ordered pair of values from, <coughs> excuse me, I have a cough, uh, an ordered pair of values from the Landberg file, where the x-coordinate came from its measurement of the wind speed and its y-coordinate came from its measurement of the wind direction. I don't actually have those paired up correctly. Clearly that wind speed is not matched up correctly to the one that I have drawn in the box here of 7.42. I didn't feel like scrolling through 54,000 lines looking for that particular one. But it's just a number that came from the file. Now let's take a look at that number that actually came from the file of 7.42 meters per second. It's a real number. Okay, remember from like math classes about the differences between real and imaginary? Okay, wind observations, temperature observations, pressure observations, things that are sensed by instruments are real numbers. And in particular, they are a subset of the real numbers called the rational numbers. You might remember that once you had the set of all real numbers, there were two different groups within the, the set of real numbers the rational and the irrational. Observations are always rational numbers. And I have a little dictionary definition from Google up here of what we mean by a rational number. I mean, I think we know just from the name that a rational number is a number that can be written as a ratio. It means it can be written as a fraction <clears throat> with a numerator and a denominator, or it can be written with a decimal. And it will either have a finite number of decimal places, or it will have an infinite number of decimal places, but they repeat like point three 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 three. Anytime you have a number that just is expressed in terms of digits, like 7.42, that's clearly a rational number. If nothing else, I could express this number as 742 divided by 100. Ta-da! It is a rational number. 
any kind of number that you can write in a finite way on a piece of paper or type on a computer screen or whatever is a rational number. But that doesn't mean that there aren't irrational numbers. In fact, irrational numbers are hugely important too. That rational number that is the actual observation that your instrument wrote to a file or the data logger wrote to a file or whatever, it's just an estimate of what the real winds are doing right now. And the real, I mean, there's always problems of precision and accuracy and so on. And no matter what, that estimate is a real number. And so is the actual, you know, what is the wind actually really doing right now? That is also a real number. The real wind is not imaginary in any way, uh, in the mathematical sense. But here's the deal. The true wind, what is actually the speed of the molecules passing through an instrument right now, is not a rational number. It's an irrational number. Now, irrational numbers are much harder in some ways to work with. Again, to just cut and paste the definition that Google gives you if you type define irrational number. In mathematics, an irrational number is a number that cannot be expressed as a ratio of integers. Uh, that is to say, as a fraction. Irrational numbers, when written, do not repeat and are infinite. Pi is an example of an irrational number. Euler's E is another example of an irrational number. But actually, any physical measurement, what you're actually measuring in the real world, is an irrational number. My thermometer that I keep here in my office currently says that it is 69.8 degrees in my office. Okay, that is a rational number. 69.8, if nothing else, could be written as 698 divided by 10. It is a rational number. My, it is the number that this instrument is reporting to me. But the actual temperature in this room is an, is an irrational number. It, I don't know how close this, uh, well calibrated this particular thermometer is and so on, but the real temperature in this room maybe is 69.82387528281 and goes on forever. It's an irrational number. This observation that I'm getting is by necessity a an estimate of the, it is a rational number estimate of what our real temperature in the room is, which is in fact an irrational number. This is pretty theoretical stuff, but it's going to give us insights as to what we're going to be doing in the second part of this lecture. In part two of this lecture, we're going to be seeing how wind speeds are distributed. How, as in like, how often do we get wind speeds of a particular speed? How often is the wind speed stronger than this? How often is the wind speed in this range, etc.? And we'll see that the fact that the instrument only provides us with estimates of the wind speed affects our understanding of that distribution. And actually more at a deeper level, we'll see the fact that these observations are, that the true wind speed, not what the instrument is measuring, but the true wind speed is actually an irrational number, actually changes our whole idea of what we mean by a distribution of the wind speeds anyway. I mean, it's going to be hard to figure out exactly, well, what are the chances that the wind is at particular speed? when we can't even know for sure with a finite number of digits what the wind's speed is. That's going to have kind of an interesting theoretical uh, consequence to how we're understanding the information that is coming to us from our anemometers. But before we move on to part two, I want to ask, I want to get a couple things straightened out, so let's ask five quick questions. Question one, out at some field site, you have an instrument that seems to break a lot and often doesn't record an observation that you need. Like maybe your anemometer keeps breaking and it's transmitting missing values rather than good observations. For this data record, the recovery rate would be high, low, zero, or negative. Would the, how, what, what would you say about the recovery rate of an instrument that breaks a lot? All right, make a choice from those four options and get a little feedback before you move on to question two. 